today we're going to talk about complex numbers. By the end of this video, you should be able to simplify powers of i, simplify radical expressions, and perform operations with complex numbers. Let's take a look at this graph first. This is the graph of y equals x squared plus 1. If I asked you to find the x-intercepts of this graph, you would tell me that there are none because it does not cross the x-axis. If I asked you to solve the equation 0 equals x squared plus 1, that's the same thing as asking you to find the x-intercepts of the graph because you're trying to find where that graph equals 0. So if we start doing some algebra, first we would subtract 1 from both sides. Then we would take the square root of both sides. And you'd end up with x equals square root of negative 1, which up until now would mean that you would write there are no real solutions to this equation, which is correct, but there are solutions. They are just not real numbers. So we'll come back to this in a few minutes. Last class we talked about complex numbers. I is a complex number. The definition of I is that I squared equals negative 1 or I equals the square root of negative 1 which until now you have not been able to take the square root of negative numbers. Now I'm telling you that you can, you just get a complex number as an answer. So let's go back to that previous problem. So here, if we have that x equals the square root of negative 1, instead of writing no real solution, we could write that x equals plus or minus i. Now, the plus or minus comes from the fact that when we take the square root of a number, we always have two answers. For example, if you are taking the square root of 9, you're asking yourself, what squared will give me 9? Well, 3 squared gives you 9, but negative 3 squared also gives you 9. So technically, positive 3 and negative 3 are the square root of 9. So the same thing applies here when we're talking about complex numbers. Since i is the square root of negative 1, you will always have a plus or minus in your answer. So let's take a look at some powers of i. We've said in the definition that i squared equals negative 1. We know that i is the square root of negative 1, or in this case, I'm going to just say that i equals i. And let's try to figure out what i to the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, etc. power are. So i cubed is the same thing as saying i squared times i. We've already figured out that i squared is negative 1 which was given in the definition, and we know that i is just i. So if we multiply those together, we get that i cubed equals negative i. Now let's look at i to the fourth. i squared squared gives you i to the fourth, which we know that i squared is negative 1, and if we square that, we just get 1. So, so far we know that i is just i, i squared is negative 1, i cubed simplifies to negative i, i to the fourth simplifies to 1. So let's keep looking at a few more powers of i. i to the fifth can be rewritten as i to the fourth times i which we know i to the fourth is just one and we know that i is i so that can be simplified to just i i to the sixth you can write as i to the fourth times i squared 
which would be 1 times negative 1, which is negative 1, i to the 7th, you can write as i to the 4th times i cubed, which we know would give us 1 times negative i, which equals negative i. And i to the 8th, we can write as i to the 4th times i to the 4th, which gives us 1 times 1, which is just 1. So let's look at this pattern that we've generated. We've got i, negative 1, negative i, 1. i, negative 1, negative i, 1. And you can continue doing this, and you will always end up simplifying to those same four things, either i, negative 1, negative i, or 1. So we can figure out a shortcut. The easiest way to do this is to take the exponent divide by 4, and then look at the decimal part of the answer. Then you can just use this pattern. So if we have i to the fifth, and we divide 5 by 4, we get 1.25. So if your answer ends in 0.25, it's going to be equivalent to i, or i to the fifth, which also simplifies to i. If you take i squared, or i to the sixth, and divide those exponents by 4, you end up with something that ends in a 0.5. Those will all simplify to negative 1. If you take i cubed or i to the 7th and you divide 3 or 7 by 4, you end up with a number that ends in 0.75. That will simplify to negative i. And then if you take 4 or 8 and divide them by 4, those divide evenly. So there's no decimal or they're 0. 0.0. That will simplify to 1. So if you remember this pattern, it makes it a lot easier to simplify powers of i. So let's use that pattern to simplify these four examples. If we have i to the 14th, 14 divided by 4, and then you want to look at the decimal part of the answer. So let's grab our calculator and do 14 divided by 4. That gives us 3.5. So we just want to look at the decimal part of the answer. And then if we go back and look at this chart that we made, since it ends in 0.5, we know that this is going to simplify to negative 1. If you prefer, you can continue out the pattern from what we started with i, i squared, i cubed, i to the fourth, etc. But that's going to be more challenging when you have large numbers, so using this shortcut is helpful. For the next one, we have i to the 27th. So if we have 27 divided by 4, we can type that in our calculator. We get 6.75. Again, we only care about the decimal part of the answer. So this answer ends in 0.75. So if you look back at the chart, you know that this is going to be equivalent to negative i. Now, if you have an example like this last one, i to the 2,349th power, this is where this trick comes in handy. You take 2,349, divide by 4. So let's type that in our calculators. You get 587.25. This ends in 0.25. So if you look at the previous slide and look at the pattern, if it ends in 0.25, you know this is equivalent to I.
Now, this next problem says rewrite negative 1 as a power of i, where the exponent is between 25 and 33. This means we want to write the problem. We want it to equal negative 1. So we want to have i to some power where that exponent is between 25 and 33. So if we use this pattern that we've figured out, we know that if we want it to equal negative 1, that when you do the exponent divided by 4, it has to end in a point 5. So you can just start going through, starting with 25, and going to 33, and see which numbers, when divided by 4, end in point 5. So start with 25. That doesn't work. 26 works. So you could have i to the 26th. You can keep going with the pattern. Do 27 divided by 4, 28 divided by 4. But you should figure out that 30 also works. You get 7.5 in that case, so it does end in a 0.5. Those are the only two um, where the exponent is between 25 and 33, where they simplify to negative 1. Hopefully you remember how to simplify square roots. You look for the largest perfect square that goes into whatever number you're taking the square root of. So it's the same process even though there's a negative number. Remember your perfect squares are 1, 4, 9, 16, 25, 36, etc. So if we look at those numbers and see which of those goes into 48, we know that 48 is 4 times 12, but 4 is not the largest perfect square that goes into 48. It's actually 16. 16 times 3 gives you 48. I'm going to rewrite the square root of negative 48 as the square root of 16 times the square root of 3. Now, since we have a negative 48, I'm going to add square root of negative 1 into this as well. So you can see that if I have negative 1 times 16 times 3, that gives you negative 48. So I haven't changed the problem at all. I'm just breaking it into smaller radicals. So we know that the square root of negative 1 is i. We know that the square root of 16 is 4. And we can't take the square root of 3. So we'll just leave that as square root of 3. So now we can take these three terms and rewrite this. Typically, you'll see this written as 4i square root of 3. So the square root will always come last in your final answer. Um, the real numbers, so 4, will come first. And then the i usually goes between the real number and the radical. So that is the simplified version of square root of negative 48. Now, standard form for complex numbers. Usually you will see complex numbers written in the form a plus bi. So a is the real part of a complex number. bi is the imaginary part. So we can write real numbers or pure imaginary numbers in this a plus bi form as well. So if we have the number 9, we can rewrite that as 9 plus 0i. Typically, you'll just see it written as 9, but it's important to realize that 9 is a complex number as well. With 3i, this is a pure imaginary number, as we talked about last class. You can rewrite this as 0 plus 3i. So it's important to realize that 
every number is a complex number. Whether it's an integer, whether it's a fraction, whether it's a pure imaginary number, they are all technically complex numbers. So let's go ahead and do some operations with complex numbers. We can add, subtract, and multiply complex numbers. We won't talk about division yet because that's a little bit more complicated, but we will get to that later this year. So for the most part, treat i the way you would treat x. So if you had 3 plus 2x plus 5 minus 7x, you would combine the integers and the terms with x. So it's the same idea here. You're going to combine the real parts of the complex numbers and the imaginary parts of the complex numbers. So 3 and 5 are the real parts. So 3 plus 5 is just 8. The imaginary parts of these numbers are 2i and negative 7i. So if I add those together, I get negative 5i. So the sum of these two complex numbers is 8 minus 5i. We can subtract complex numbers as well. So if we look at the next problem, it says you have negative 2 plus 8i minus 4 minus 3i. I think it's easiest to distribute the negative to the second complex number. That way you don't accidentally make an error with the sign. And then you combine the real components and the imaginary components just like we did in the previous problem. So negative 2 plus negative 4 is negative 6. And then 8i plus 3i is 11i. So our final answer is negative 6 plus 11i. Now the next problem doesn't necessarily look like it's involving complex numbers, but since we have square roots of negative numbers, we're going to have i in these problems as well. Now it's important to remember two things about this problem. First, you should simplify the square roots before you start multiplying. And then you also need to remember how to multiply square roots, which since these are all square roots, you can just multiply the numbers inside of them. So first, I'm going to split these up. Square root of negative 10. Now there's no perfect square that goes into 10. But since we have a square root of a negative, we can split this up into square root of negative 1 times square root of 10. We can do the same thing with square root of negative 2. We can split it up to be square root of negative 1 times square root of 2. And then square root of negative 5, again, there's no perfect square that's a factor of 5, but we can split it up to square root of negative 1 times square root of 5. So now we know that the square root of negative 1 is i. So here I have i square root of 10. The second part of my product turns into i square root of 2. And the third part turns into i square root of 5. So now I can go ahead and multiply. When I multiply all the i's together, I end up with i cubed. Then if I multiply 10 times 2 times 5, that gives me 100. So I end up with square root of 100. Now I can continue to simplify this. We've already discussed that i cubed can be simplified. We said earlier that this simplifies to negative i. Then hopefully you know that the square root of 100 is 10. So typically you would not leave your answer as negative i times 10. You would rewrite it as negative 10 i. Now if you multiplied all the numbers together first, you would end up with square root of negative 100, which would just give you 10 i, not negative 10 i. So it is important that you simplify each square root first. Now, the next problem has us multiplying two complex numbers. This is going to be just like double distributing that we did when we checked our answers for factoring. So I'm going to distribute the 3 
to the second complex number. So I have 3 times 5 is 15. 3 times 4i is 12i. Then I'm going to distribute the 2i. So I have 2i times 5, which is 10i. And 2i times 4i is going to give me 8i squared. Now we can go ahead and combine our like terms. We end up with 15 plus 22i plus 8i squared. Now, earlier we said that i squared can be simplified to negative 1. So I'm going to rewrite this as 8 times negative 1, which gives me 15 plus 22i minus 8. So then I can combine my like terms again and end up with 7 plus 22i. And remember that when we're writing our complex numbers in standard form, we put the real component first and the imaginary part second. As you get more comfortable with complex numbers, you won't have to write out all the steps that I wrote out for this problem. But for now, go ahead and write out the steps. And when you get more used to working with complex numbers, you can skip from here to here, probably. All right, let's look at two more problems. The next problem says to multiply, just like we did on the previous problem. So I'm going to distribute the 6 to the second complex number and end up with 36 plus 18i. Then I'm going to distribute the negative 3i to the second complex number and get negative 18i minus 9i squared. So when we combine our like terms here, the positive 18i and the negative 18i will cancel out. So I have 36 minus 9, and then we already said that i squared is negative 1. So this gives me 36 plus 9, which is 45. Now notice here that we end up with 45 as our answer. Our i's all canceled out. So whenever you multiply two complex numbers together and you get an answer that is a real number that does not have any i's in your answer, these are called conjugates. You need to remember that word. And the term conjugate refers to the two complex numbers that we multiplied together. Now let's try this last problem. We have some addition and some multiplication going on, but we just follow our normal order of operations like you learned in middle school. So we're going to start by distributing the negative to this first set of parentheses. Then we're going to distribute a positive 2 to the second set of parentheses. Then we just combine our like terms. So we end up with 5 plus 13i as our final answer.